Well, it's great to have you on this little uh, uh, podcast thing we're doing, uh, Portland Media, Good Old Days. Uh, you're not ashamed to be part of the good old days. You put in your time in Portland. Well, well done. Thank you. Yes, I did. Well, so did you, Carl. <laughs> and we both were able to uh, retire without being forced out, you know? Uh, well, yeah, def define forced out. Yeah, we, I, I, we were able to go out on our terms, right? Yeah, that's right, on our own terms, yeah. I always, I always envied you, too, because as a young man, you had a chance with your father to go to all those Major League Baseball stadiums. Like in one year or two years or something? Oh, it was in one month. One month. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. It was one summer, uh, 1977. My brother and I and dad hopped in the car in July, and we drove around the country for a month in August, through August, and saw a game in every major league park. That required quite a logistical planning, right? Yeah, it sure <laughs> did. Yeah, just to, to map out that trip and to uh, – to make the arrangements, uh, you know, it was one of, one of the exposures I got to journalism uh, that kind of interested me in the career, because as we moved along through the country to do that, we became uh, a news story in the different markets, oh. you know, these, here these guys show up in Minneapolis, this dad and two kids uh, watching baseball games, and so we, we did a lot of TV interviews and newspaper interviews, and so I got one of my earliest exposures to that, uh, that career and ended up doing it for 31 years. Yeah, well, that's great. <laughs> well, you, sir, did, uh, uh, is 40 years the correct number for you at COIN? It continuously for 40 years, yes. I started, but I actually started in 68 as an intern out of college. Uh, got a job there. I was facing the draft to Vietnam, so I decided to enlist in OCS program, and they gave me an extra four months, and so I was able to get a intern job at COIN for uh, four months in 1968. And while I was there, they let me, John Armstrong, who was my uh, benefactor, he was the news director, uh, let me learn everything I, you know, I could. I was, I wrote stories, I produced a little noon show, and even let me anchor the noon show once, um, because the regular anchor was sick. <laughs> and he said, uh, he said, you can anchor it, Mike, I don't think anyone watches it anyway. So... <laughs> And I actually got to do um, on-camera reports in those four months, so it was wonderful. That was that was my taste of television journalism. Yeah, uh, they don't do those internships as much as they used to. I was the same benefactor. I did my internship at KGW in the summer of '82 in the sports department with Al Keck and Scott Lynn, and uh -huh. I was I was writing stories for them. I was going out interviewing people. I was editing for them. I got one story on the air because the union contract allowed that. And, um, you know, that was, the, that was the way a lot of people got started. And over time, those internship programs went away. And that was unfortunate. It is unfortunate. It's a great learning opportunity. I, I think the theory I heard at King Broadcasting, which was KGW, was at some point, uh, some of the interns were asking to get paid. You know, when I did it, and probably you too, you just got your credit at college, and you were very happy to, uh, right. to, to to do that and get the experience. But I think they got some people that thought, well, I'm I'm doing work here that other people are getting paid for, so I should get paid. And I'll instead of going through the legal fight, they just said, screw it, we're not going to have insurance anymore. <laughs> That's right. I think that was the reason. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then, did you uh, do some military service after your internship? Yes, I, uh, after those four months, I went uh, into infantry. <laughs> I had my choice, infantry, artillery, or armor, and I decided I didn't want to be stuck in a tank and didn't like loud noises, so I chose the infantry. And uh, I went to uh, infantry training at Fort Dix, New Jersey in the winter, so I was firing machine guns on snowdrifts. And in the summer, then I went to uh, infantry OCS at Fort Benning, Georgia, <laughs> where it was 100 degrees or more and uh, with high humidity. And uh, I got my commission. Uh, then I had an opportunity to transfer, branch transfer to Signal Corps. And they assigned me to um, the Pentagon with the Army Photo Agency, which was wonderful. I was like a graduate degree um, in communications because we, we had all of the Army's uh, 
photo services from a portrait studio to a TV studio. All the, the film library, picture, pictorial library was there. So I, I was a producer as a young tenant. I was a producer of um, audiovisual products for, for Westmoreland staff. That was my, my job there at the Pentagon. Wow. It was, it was one memory, one great memory was my first assignment when I got there uh, was to fly over the moratorium, which, as you may remember, was that huge anti war protest in Washington, D.C. Hundreds of thousands of people came from all over the country. And I was up there in a Huey helicopter sitting next to a photographer who was on this brand new, it was on something new called a Tyler mount, which steadied your camera. Mm -hmm. And he was taking shots of the demonstrators down below, and I was sitting next to him with binoculars and a, and a monitor, identifying for the communication people or the strategic people down below what they were looking at, kind of orienting them. I was their um, eye in the sky, so to speak. So I had to do this quick study of the geography of Washington, D.C., after only been there for a couple of days, having been there a couple of days. And it was it was a wonderful <laughs> initiation. I mean, we flew over the protesters, and they flashed peace signs to us. And uh, it was it was a great opportunity for me to to start my job. At that you were you were you were you were the military spy keeping an eye on the uh, on the protesters that day, Mike. I was. They had uh, soldiers and police all over town in case something happened. Nothing did. It went off very peacefully. Uh, but just in case they wanted to have a advanced intelligence. So that was me in, in the helicopter. So was there ever a time during this uh, service where uh, there was the possibility that you would serve on the ground in Vietnam? There, there was a possibility. My name came up twice uh, to go, but each time I was either, um, I was involved in some kind of project for the chief of staff. And so I didn't have to go. I was one of those, I think they said during Vietnam, for every one combat soldier, there were five people in support in some role. And so I guess I was in support, you might say. We, uh, we received all the video from the combat photographers, and then we put them together into films and television programs. Uh, I don't think uh, people um, <clears throat> after our generation understand the, um, uh, just the tension about that time. Uh, about Vietnam, about how things were changing in the 60s. I was a little bit younger than you, but I mean, I grew up watching, uh, you know, the Vietnam news coverage on Huntley and Brinkley and Walter Cronkite. Uh, I, I just don't, you know, and we don't have a draft now, and the military uh, it, uh, is, is much different, but that was an incredibly tense time for people of your age and my age uh, with what was going on in our country. Yes. Oh, no question. And the poor, the poor veterans who came back from Vietnam and they were not appreciated at all. And it was unfortunate. They, I think we've come to appreciate them more in, in later oh, I years. I hope so. I yeah. totally hope so. Um, so uh, after the military service, now this was after you got out of college, right? You, got University out of, college, of Oregon. Internship. I was in the military for almost four years. They let us out a little bit early because they had too many officers. I got out, I was a captain, and so I came back to COIN and got a full-time reporter's job in 72 and uh, stayed there until I retired in 2012. So, so 40 years continuously, yeah. Uh, was, I remember my, you know, I watched, we watched the news at my house uh, mm -hmm. and uh, I mean, I'm, I think I remember the Huntley Brinkley report. That's where, but I remember my father, who was the news watcher, uh, kind of changed uh, allegiances in the Portland market over time. I, I remember that we used to watch KGW with Richard Ross, uh, and then I think my father followed him to K2, and we ended, we, we eventually ended up as coin watchers when you were there anchoring the news. I think with with Ted Bryant. Does that make sense? Is my memory good Ted there? Came over, yes, Ted came over from Channel Two to be our news director. And he also tried to anchor for a little while. Didn't really work out. And um, yeah, that, that was the time. Um, yeah. Jim Rao was with me at first. He I remember Jim. Co anchor, yeah. And then uh, Linda Koble became our first uh, woman co anchor with me on the five, or actually it was the six then and the mm -hmm. 11. Uh, 
I bet <laughs> having done that for as many years as you did, there's a long list of co-anchors. Oh, yes. That's your long list of news directors, too. That, too, yeah. <laughs> uh, many years with Shirley Hancock, right? Yes, that was my longest term with Shirley. What a delight to work with her. She was such an encouraging and positive person, very bright and talented herself. And uh, just it just made my job so much easier. I, we had so many uh, stories that we covered that created memories that I, you know, I'll always cherish. Uh, how, how fixated were you, Mike, on news ratings? Because at, at, for quite a while, uh, Newsroom 6 with you and, and your co anchors was the number one rated news program. Uh, and of course, if you're working at the other stations, that you were keeping an eye on that. Uh, how much did you bother with that? Well, ratings were important. Um, in those days, um, when we only really had two competitors at six o'clock and there weren't that many channels on the dial, uh, ratings of, gosh, a share of 20 plus was not unusual. Right. And, and now, I mean, you know, you worked on the morning news. I mean, a one or a two would be something to get excited about. But, um, you know, as it was important. And as time went on, it became more and more important, more and more important. We had local ownership at first, and that was wonderful because they really supported us. They didn't watch the ratings that closely. They spent money on documentaries, which mm -hmm. have gone away pretty much. Um, they also supported local events, public events that were taking place in the Portland, Vancouver area, spent money on that. But then as we got under corporate control, you saw less of that. And then as <laughs> corporate disco discovered that they could make really make money off news, they began, to, um, they began to put a lot of store in ratings. It became extremely competitive. And, um, and not, not in the po most positive way. They brought in, for example, they would remove people who had news experience from decision-making roles and bring in consultants or a news director, for example, that had really no, no background in news. They were really in public relations or advertising. Or in um, the market or in Portland. They came from, you know, New York or Chicago or someplace. Exactly, yeah. So, you know, it wasn't as journalistically uh, founded as it had been in the past. Remember Not those sure. days, though, uh, King, King TV in Seattle owned KGW. Fisher out of Seattle owned... Uh, uh, KTU coin was locally owned. Uh, that's all. That's all gone now. They're owned mm -hmm. by co big companies around the country. Right. Yeah. And I think those so, of us who were who were lucky enough to live through that can tell the difference. Yes, you can. I really feel blessed to have worked when I did in in this profession. Uh, do you remember uh, ratings back then? Were in certain months. It was uh, November, February, and May. Uh, and you'd go through it and you'd be really uptight about how things were going, but you wouldn't see the results until like three weeks after that month was over. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then, you know, here comes a document. You'd look and you were up and you were down. And then came the overnights where every morning we would see exactly how many people were watching every 15 minutes uh, the previous day. And I, I found there were decisions made on, on those small little changes. Like, what story did we run at uh, 545 that made people – Go change over there and it's, it was such a minute micro managing of of an audience uh that that disappointed me a little bit so that was a result of consultants because right. they were the ones that did that kind of study and and gave you the feedback gave the news director the feedback says hey you need to do this or that uh, that's one of my frustrations with news today in terms of the content uh, there's so much um entertainment based news it's uh, it's that um Look at that, gee whiz, uh, the kind of eye candy that gets people's attention, but, but really isn't content-based. I'm, I'm, I'm not doing that all the time, but I see a lot more of that in an attempt to attract audience and to get ratings. I have a story about that, Mike. You were doing the mornings, and uh, uh, remember Charlie Sheen got in some trouble off his TV show, and he was kind of going on a, some yeah. kind of binge, and... And I remember there was some story about Charlie Sheen did this or that. And, and, and it was labeled in the script that came to me as breaking news. And, and as I read it, I kind of sarcastically looked at the, uh, at the camera and said, well, I guess we're calling this breaking news, but Charlie Sheen, blah, 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 blah. Because, wow. uh, you, know, I, I, you know, I didn't think that 
marketed or, or warranted that kind of a, a but I got uh, lectured about that. I, I got I got in trouble. The the producer whom I loved and worked with was a great producer. She kind of came at me and said, Hey, you know, we're doing what they're tell us telling us to do and if you uh kind of backhanded make a comment about it, then it's it's uh uh it's it's not we're not working at this together. So I probably deserved a little bit of a of a slap on the hand there, but I, I just couldn't take you know, oh, calling to my audience, breaking news, Charlie Sheen got arrested for drunk driving. Yeah, no, your, your, um, your, you know, your reaction was well taken by me because what bothered me was in order to use that story, you had to eliminate some other real news, which belonged in your newscast, just because it had an entertainment value to it. And, uh, it's too, you know, there's just too much of that going on. We, I always felt like you needed to treat the news with respect, you know, and what, to me, you had only had, what was it, 20 minutes or something in that half hour for the news, the rest was commercials. So you want to try to use that 20 minutes for as much real news as you could. And that's why, I, you know, I probably would have said the same thing as you did. <laughs> so let me ask you this, uh, your longevity, uh, uh, the benefit of that a little bit is, um, is a little bit of leverage or um, uh, you know some stock in, in this is Mike Donahue I've been doing this a long time were you able to leverage that into some kind of manager managing editing um, uh, a policy making or I mean could you use your longevity to say listen we need to cover this story and not that story or uh, could could you guide a newscast a little bit because of the well-earned respect and leverage you had with your longevity? I, um, I guess I, I didn't want that kind of role. People did listen to me because of my experience, um, but I didn't, I didn't want to manage the news um, or the reporters. I, I was given the role a couple of times by news directors to kind of oversee, look over the shoulder of other reporters and, uh, and help them with their stories. That was very awkward because you know the kinds of egos that there are in a newsroom. And if you start questioning the way they're doing something, even at this mark, this level market, they're gonna resent it and you're going to get feedback in a negative way from them. So I, I didn't like that role. I tried to lead by example. I guess that was my primary uh, emphasis to, to set a good example for them of the way I wrote and the way I conducted myself and the kind of stories that I did. And hopefully that had more influence than if I'd been a managing editor. Well, you led with great example for many years, my friend. Well, uh, it was, it was a pleasure to, to see some of those stories that you did and to, and to listen to you when you did write and rewrite and, uh, uh, at least in that you regard. You know what I miss most stories. doing, uh, Carl, what I miss most doing, and you may, also missed this because we don't do it much anymore are those packages those finished packages when you had a beginning a middle an end natural sound oh. um, compelling sound bites com and compelling video that matched your narration i mean i would work hard to put one of those together or two of those together for a newscast and i would feel so good when i was through it was it was like a little mini piece of artwork that you had done with video and sound and, you know, the camera person was certainly a big part of that, too, and the kind of video they shot. It was just, you don't see that much anymore. I watch, um, oh, what's his name, on uh, David Hartman on CBS. He still does packages like that on Friday nights on their evening newscast. And I try to tune in at about 5.50 every night, or 6.50 every night to see that on Friday nights, to see his stories, because they're outstanding. Uh, well, that's nice of you to say that because I, I believe, as you do, that the, the kind of the storytelling uh, yes. aspect of, of news uh, has taken a back burner to, you know, can you tweet it out and, and get it out to the audience? Uh, you know, it's, it's just so different than when we did it. And I know, you know, we're the, we're the old, old guard, but I, I agree with you. That storytelling, and I, I know you're probably the same, but I worked with some of the greatest photographers and editors uh, who would, they would, uh, it, it was a team effort on the story and, and they would come with these great ideas. They would capture incredible video that you could write to. Uh, and, 
And when you did a story like that, I agree with you. It was a piece of art. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, the great John Tuttle once said, yes. once said, who, who told, told stories like no one we ever uh, worked with, said uh, to us, um, you know, we're not doing this story for today. We're doing this story for somebody that sees it 15, 20 years down the road. Exactly. You know, we had Ray Summers who did the same kind of thing. Yeah. Yes. And so, you know, somebody looking at the archives or, 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 or somebody researching uh, something to add to a story that's going on. If you did a story today that resonated 10, 15 years down the road, uh, then you were really telling stories the way they should be done. Um, yeah. And I always remember that. I'm not always telling a story for today at five o'clock, but this story is going to live in our archives mm-hmm. for people to see for the longest time. And it's going to make an impact later on if, it, if it's done well. Mm-hmm. And no, you're right. I agree with you totally. I used to try to draw things into my stories from the archives, from because every story truly has a past as well as a present. And um, not too many people do, but I'd run around. People, people that worked with me would tell you, there's Mike running into the archives again to get some file video to put with his story. Because Mike's it, down in the basement again looking at film. <laughs> going through the boxes and because it it gave context to the story and perspective and the viewer needs to get that today you're it's so so rushed today i have so much sympathy for reporters today because they don't have time to do those packages like we did they have to run out do a live shot and then voice over some hastily cut together video that you know that doesn't really match what they're saying and because they're going three three of those a you know, show, two or three of those a show, and there's not the time to actually craft a finished product. And, and that, that's an underrated value of these new stations that have been in the market for so many years is the archives that they have. I know mm-hmm. um, KGW uh, donated a lot of it to the Oregon Historical Society. They, I was there when they transferred. Uh, one guy spent a couple of years going through all the videotape to transfer them to some kind of digital format. Uh, there are treasures in those archives of, of what our wonderful city has gone through uh, since the invention of television news and film and cameras. Uh, it, is, it is a gold mine. One of my regrets, uh, Coin, is that a gold mine they have is that they let go by and they didn't transfer it to the new generations and new types of, of video now to you know digital. Uh, I did for, in the 1980s, I did a, a program called Face to Face we did half hour interviews, in-depth interviews with newsmakers in their homes in a casual environment, often with their spouses. And those were truly gold mines because we did you know, all the governors, uh, we did police chiefs in Portland, Penny Harrington who was the first woman chief, uh, Charles Moose, the first black chief in Portland, uh, Bud Clark, the mayors, uh, even even Ivancy, we did Ivancy a face-to-face and we did, entertainers we did uh, new shoes um valerie day with new shoes You're right we, john or um, hardy was his last name thomas hardy the architect uh, we did bob farrell bob farrell's restaurant you know, all of those interviews betty roberts who was a supreme court justice we did her um those were valuable pieces of history but unfortunately uh Cole did not advance them as, as the, uh, as the media advance, and I think they're lost, uh, what I've heard from people there. So, <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, agree. Um, I, I don't know if you've seen uh, on Netflix, there's a documentary called Wild Country, which is all about the Rajneeshis. Yes, uh, yes, I and, that. And, and there is so much archival video from KGW Coin and K2 that, that they got access to that told that story uh, now, yes. 20-some years later. Uh, it, it's really valuable stuff. And but what really made that was the video that they got from the Rajneeshis, their own video. Yeah, that's that too. What we, we've never seen that before, and that, uh, for me anyway, made it even more interesting. So, Mike, uh, these days, uh, when you hear the term fake news, how, how much does that hurt? <laughs> well, I, I know it's. I know they're not all guilty of that. Um, so, I guess I. It is, it is bad, it is sad to see that, whatever that means to the individual, I guess everybody has their own definition of fake news, but um, it, you know, it, it is sad that 
that the profession that you and I were involved in for so many years was undermined by by people who I, I understand how it happens. You know this this competition, this attempt to be first with the news. Um, I understand how that pressure causes that fake news to come out, but people who deliberately do it, and of course that's often the social media that's the result that that it's the conveyor of that because people <laughs> people just want to put out what they believe and it isn't necessarily true. So it doesn't hurt me because I know there are people in our profession still striving not to have fake news, but it, it is an indictment. It is an indictment, especially of the social media today. Uh, I it it hurts me because I guess I'll hear it from people who, who I, I, I know and I trust and I am friends with, have relationship with it, and, and I'll hear it. And then I, I need to remind them, uh, you trusted me for mm -hmm. 31 years. And I, and I can tell you that I, I never uh, did anything that was fake and, and nothing around me when I was there uh, was fake. Uh, so if, if, if you're not trusting that, or at least giving that the benefit of the doubt, then, then you're not trusting my 31 years in this business where, where you did listen to me and you did uh, trust that the process by which we were going to uh, learn about what was going on in our community was trustworthy. And it, it really disappoints me. I think we're, uh, we're a little lazy in terms of being poor uh, rec receivers of news because there are ways to check that out online. Oh, people. yes stories you can you can put them to rest easily uh, if you just check out a couple of website websites but um, unfortunately we're lazy and we tend to swallow something that sounds like we want to believe it because it confirms our own bias or prejudice yeah it is a different time isn't it <laughs> it is it definitely is how did you feel about the uh, how do you feel about the coverage of the pandemic i mean to me, and I'm not sure about you, but to me, the biggest news story in my career was the eruption of Mount St. Helens. But now that's been eclipsed by uh, the pandemic, which is an enormous news story. But the frustrating thing about it is that these poor reporters have to do their interviews like we're doing this one, you know, th through Zoom or some other type of device on a laptop. They can't actually be at the site of the story talking to that person or persons involved face to face. Uh, and I feel sorry for them in that, in that regard. Uh, yeah, it certainly has. Well, it has changed. And, and, and you know, there's nothing. You can't exchange the value of being there face to face. Uh, but you know what? It, I mean, it does, it does get, it makes it easier to get news uh, True. On, on the air. I mean, you know, I, I, if, I, uh, if I needed to interview somebody, it, you know, let's say I need to do somebody in Salem. That's a 45 minute drive. Luckily we could maybe feed the tape back uh, and I had to fit somebody's schedule. Whereas I could say, hey, can you be in front of your computer in, in, uh, in 30 minutes? I can crank this out 15 minutes. And uh, it, so it just changes the access a little bit. It does. And I think there's some, each time you add another uh, wall between you and that actual source and the, and the site of the story, I was, uh, during the fires, I wished I was back in the newsroom again, because in that case, you could be out there in the field talking to the people affected by the fires and actually see, you know, photographers were shooting video of the story. And it, that was exciting to me. Uh, covering the pandemic has not been something I, I miss. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people have asked, you know, do you miss it? And I, and I, I really don't. I mean, I think I, I did my time <laughs> and uh, uh, I, I hopefully I would have been able to adjust uh, with the times and the technology as I did over the 30 years that I was doing it. Uh, but um, during this time, I'm, I'm glad I'm retired right now. I, I agree with you. I, I, again, I just felt, feel so blessed that I was able to work when I did. Um, they had travel budgets when I was working. I was, Gosh, I saw so much of the world. We uh -huh. went to Egypt a couple of times. We went to St. Petersburg, Russia, and we went to a rural area of, of, of Russia to uh, follow this um, Valery Chokloff, the guy who landed in Vancouver after the first transpolar flight. Oh my gosh, we followed tourists into China when they first got opened up to tourists. 
We uh, follow, I went with a group of businessmen from the West Coast to Taiwan, uh, followed Governor Atiyah on a trade mission to Saudi Arabia and Egypt and Syria. Mike, that doesn't, that doesn't happen now. No, no, now an out-of-town story is, is Eugene. <laughs> oh, yeah. I can remember uh, when I first started, I was a sports reporter to start, man. I was on a plane to L.A. for NBA playoffs within a couple of months and, you know, followed uh, college basketball teams to NCAA tournament games. And, uh, you know, then came the time where we can't afford to do that anymore. We'll just get the pictures on the game and, and uh, show the highlights. A- I did have an experience. I think it was, I think it was about 1990, um, maybe maybe 2000. There was a plane crash. You may remember it. Alaska Airlines was flying back from South America or Central America and crashed in the ocean 40 miles uh, north of Los Angeles. The story was breaking about uh, about five o'clock at night. Shirley and I were sitting on the anchor desk reporting these bulletins as they came in, and during a commercial break. The news director comes out and grabs me and says, you're going to Los Angeles tonight. And, uh, you know, we're like five hours away. <laughs> so I call my wife she, to pack my suitcase. I rush home. My daughter drives me on the van field in the rain and the dark to the, to the airport. I get there just in time to meet my photographer, Bruce Collins. We get on the plane. We fly to Los Angeles. We rent a car. All this time, I'm listening to local radio reports, making calls to the newsroom to get the latest on the crash. We arrive at the at the scene. The sat trucks are all set up there, just off the coast. They crashed where the crash uh, crash occurred, and I literally I don't know if it was five to eleven or whatever it was. I walked into the lights. They handed me a microphone, and I went on the air live as our lead story at eleven o'clock that night. If you after, believe that. after being on the air in Portland at five o'clock. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, having been six hours before <laughs> on the set in Portland, yeah. That's good news hustle, Mike. Well done. <laughs> well, yeah, it just all worked right. <laughs> uh, so I, I made a list here. I'm going to read you a list and, and I guess see if you can tell me uh, what these people have in common here, if I can read it to you, Mike. What uh, they have in common with me or with... Well, well just all, tell me what all these people have in common. Tracy Berry, Kathy Smith, Matt Zafino, Dave Selesky, Bruce Sussman, Kathy Kimora, Jeff Chianola, Julie Emery, Paul Lindman, Rod Hill, Nancy Francis, uh, Amy Troy. Uh, let's see. I can't even read my own writing. Ann Jagger, Dan Tilkin, uh, Kelly Love, Claudia Brown, Carl Click. Well, they all worked in this market. Um... For television news stations, they they all worked for more than one TV station oh. in this market. They all changed teams at some point in their career, uh, and you, sir, stayed at the same place for all those years. How did that happen? Well, I guess it's because uh, it kept changing for me. The, my job was never boring. Um, I enjoyed it. There was there always seemed to be rewards, and when my contract would come up, there was a a reason to stay. Um, every day, you know, the way I looked at my career, every day was an adventure. I mean, with the assignment that you received, with, with the stories that you covered, with the people you worked with, I mean, that's what really made me stay, I guess, is because I loved the people I worked with. They, they just were, they were terrific. And, um, you don't want to leave something like that. Um, I, you know, I had offers. I don't mean to say that there was... There were opportunities to go to other markets and also to change, change saddles here, <laughs> here in the Portland area, but um, they, they just weren't attractive to me because I enjoyed the people at COIN. Oh, that's so nice to hear. Uh, um, I enjoyed people in both the stations I worked with, KGW and KTU, sure. uh, yeah. and had, had some reasons for making a change, as did all those people on that list. But it's, it's so nice to hear you say that about a place, because uh, it's so rare. Uh, you know, it's, it's rare that somebody stays in a market as long as we did, uh, but to be at the same place all those uh, years is really, a, uh, that is a badge of honor, my friend. <laughs> that is really, well, really impressive. I, I never thought of it that way. I mean, it was continuous, you're right, in one station. Um, I suppose some people say I was stuck in a rut, but no. it was a rut to be stuck in. <laughs> uh, so tell me about uh, Mike Donahue's life now after news. What, what are you doing? Um, I am uh, volunteering on uh, 
as on the boards of three different nonprofits in our community here. Mm -hmm. I feel like, you know, that what we're talking about is all in the past. I want to move forward. I want to, some people call it refiring instead of retiring. And I, I want to do something, you know, to, for my community. So I'm on a, a board for the city club. Uh, as we have our own city club here in Newburgh, where we bring in speakers and we're, we're going to be doing it by zoom. We're going to start uh, in January by zoom. I'm also on the board for the hospital Providence hospital foundation. Um, I worked for Providence for about three years after coin doing online news stories for them uh, about their um, caregivers and their patients, some of the things that they were doing. And that was fun. I enjoyed mm -hmm. doing that. But uh, so I'm on the, that board. I'm also on a board that plans the uh, mayor's prayer breakfast every year here in the community. So that's what I'm doing. I'm, I like to walk. we we'll walk with my wife. I play pickleball. I'm a huge sports fan of teams of all ages. Um, I'm a Yankees fan since I was. Oh, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> I think I think I saw you at the Kingdom once that when I was up there watching against my dad and you were up there. We usually lost to the Kingdom, the Yankees that is. <laughs> the Mayors had this this um, fix on them somehow, this jinx on them. So Oh, well, um, I'm glad to hear you're a you're a pickleball player, Mike. We have a good pickleball club up here at Blackview Ranch. We gotta get you to uh, to come be a guest player. Well, we love to cut I love to vacation there with the family. We've done that many, many years and uh I've heard they have more pickleball courts now than they do tennis courts there. Uh, move in that direction. They, they, they're just, they're, <laughs> they have some tennis courts they're converting over, but uh, that's, that's popular here and, and, and many, many places. So I'm glad that you are uh, uh, getting into to that sport as well. I fish. I go fishing. Um, I read books. You know, when, when I was working all the time, it was difficult to read that much. And uh, so many books, so little time. And with all the people home with the pandemic, we're getting more and more books. But uh, I, I enjoy reading. Um, see, what else am I doing with my time? Just it's you, with the pandemic, we've been kind of housebound. So doing lots of projects at home. I, I actually enjoy a little uh, washing dishes, doing cleaning, um, <laughs> making the bed, you know, some of those house husband things. And uh, that's actually been fun to do. Uh, yeah, I think all of us are looking for different projects during this pandemic. I can't wait to uh, to get a vaccine and be able to get back out there and uh, yes. and uh, be face to face with folks again uh, more than we are now. So hug my daughter again. I have one that's an essential worker, and she's uh, she's on the front lines. And I she comes out here, but uh, we live in Newburgh now. But she, she has to sit on the patio, you know, ten feet away from me with a mask on. So it's, and and uh, what does she do, Mike? She works with the homeless, uh, helping find temporary housing and eventually full, full time housing for the homeless in Portland. Uh, yeah, we have uh, our daughter is a, a anesthesiologist in Philadelphia right now, and so oh, uh, yeah. so she's we're doing a lot of FaceTime. We had to cancel a trip back there, but uh, I think she's first in line for a vaccine here pretty soon. So that's going to make oh, us a little bit so. more relaxed. Yeah, that will be good. Well, I appreciate you giving us some time here on our little podcast, Mike. It's really uh, great to catch up and to hear some stories from the good old days. And someday soon we can do it face to face. Yes. Yeah.